Good evening, everybody. Um, so I'm Professor Laura Hartness Brennan. I'm the Associate Pro Vice Chancellor here in the Faculty of Science and Engineering um, at the University of Liverpool, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome everybody. We've got staff, students, some of Mark's friends and family are visiting the university for the first time. So fabulous to have you at this special event and in such a lovely, um, lovely building as well. So I'm just going to introduce a little bit about Mark. I'm sure many of you know him much better than I do, but I'm hoping to do this some justice. Um, so Mark has been with us at the University of Liverpool for some time. Um, he started his journey by studying mechanical engineering um, as an, an undergraduate degree, and after he graduated in 1989, he continued here at Liverpool studying for a PhD in structural crash worthiness, and this was under the supervision of Professor Norman Jones. And I think this really laid the foundations for his fantastic research career that then followed. So after his PhD, um, Mark worked as a postdoctoral researcher and an experimental officer in the areas of blast and impact loading of structures and crashworthiness of commercial aircraft. Sometime later, um, in 2000, he joined the Flight Science and Technology Research Group, and this was led by Professor Gareth Padfield, first as a senior experimental officer and then as a, as a principal. In, this role, in these roles, he supported the development of flight simulation facilities and really kick-started his research in flight simulation and fidelity. So he began his academic career um, as an academic member of staff in 2012 when he was appointed as a lecturer and he then was swiftly promoted through the ranks to senior lecturer and then to personal chair in 2019, an achievement which we're all, of course, here to celebrate. Mark is also the head of Division of Aerospace here at the University of Liverpool, leading on teaching and research in flight simulation. He's very highly regarded in his field. He's a fellow of the Royal Aeronautical Society, and this is actually the highest membership grade that's attainable for the society. And he's a member of their flight simulation and rotorcraft specialist groups. He's made many important contributions to his field and to his research community. Um, I'll just name a few of those highlights, because there are many. He's the technical chair of the Vertical Flight so Society's Forum 79 conference yeah, and a member of their modeling and simulation and safety technical committees. He's actively involved in NATO research task groups as vice chair and also as a member on topics including flight simulation fidelity and helicopter ship launch and recovery operations. He also contributes to US helicopter safety and working groups on rotorcraft modeling and simulation fidelity requirements and the use of simulation for certification. It's clear that Mark is an internationally leading researcher in his field. He collaborates with leading flight test and flight simulation research groups from around the world, as well as a number of major industry partners. He's been conducting flight testing with the National Research Council of Canada over a period of 15 years in support of his simulation fidelity research, a, a rather unique achievement in, in UK academia. And the quality of research conducted with Professor Owen has been acknowledged through a NATO Panel Ex Excellence Award and two BAE System Innovation Awards. During his time as an academic member of staff, he's actually secured over £7 million of research funding and he's published over 230 journal and conference papers and industry reports. Now, that's enough for me. I'm sure we're all uh, very much looking forward to hearing more from more, uh, Mark about flight simulation. So I'm just going to hand over to him and thank you again for joining us at this very special event. Thank you. No pressure. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm coming along to see what I've been playing around with for the last 22 years or so. Um, the, the lecture today is just a highlight of some of the work that's been going on. It's not a technical lecture, it's just trying to give a sense of the kind of things that we've been doing in modeling and simulation, um, the engagement with the students and the researchers uh, over that period of time, uh, and some of the lessons learned um, and, and things that have changed behaviors, um, and I thought I'd share those kind of things with you as we go through this. Where are our undergrads? Don't worry, I'm not going to ask a question, okay? <laughs> So one of the things that come in at the end, so I'm going to show kind of research highlights as, we, as we've done various bits and pieces. Um, and what I hope you get from this at the end, it's, it's a really interesting opportunity to get involved with this type of research. So the Flight Sim Group team, are they here? Anyone from FSG? Michael Doom. Um, we're going to show something at the end and just say, well, if we've done all this, what are the opportunities for new researchers to get involved um, and what are the challenges and the fun things that they might like to do as part of that? So in terms of the presentation, there's three main themes. Um, we'll talk a little bit about flight training, 
something on operational clearances and ship design, and a little bit on aircraft certification. So different uses of simulation for different purposes. And I'm going to finish with a little bit on what might be coming next. OK. Um, when we do these kind of things, the first thing is, what do people think flight sim people do? Um, so this is what my kids think I do. I sit around playing, pretending I'm Tom Cruise, on flight simulators that have got really poor visuals, because the PS is much more uh, advanced than anything that I've got access to, and I'm a geek. Correct? Correct. And I say, yes, I am a geek. I'm someone who generates excellent engineering knowledge. It took me ages to come up with that one, but hopefully you get <laughs> at the end of this, that there is new knowledge that we're gaining, and, and, and there's been a journey as we've been going through this. What my colleagues think I do. <laughs> Hi, Becky. And uh, there is a theme that I've, I've seen emerge as we go through this presentation. I don't always travel first class. <laughs> Sometimes I'm very lucky to have pilots that you'll see later on. And yes, I do go off there and go look at planes when I'm at conferences and aircraft carriers, because that's the kind of person I am. What do I spend a lot of time doing? Watching PC not work. Um, and look there, but people around me can actually go and make them work to do the kind of things that I actually want them to do. In terms of the simulation facilities, we've got two real uh, themes to what we uh, use the simulators for. One's for the, uh, for the teaching side. So all these simulators that we have here are open and available for the students to get involved with. I know the title of the thing, uh, the, the lecture is, is about uh, it being a game. But essentially, the students have got access to a gaming environment where they can learn by doing. And one of the things we want to foster with the engineering students at Liverpool is by doing that. You learn by doing things, solving problems, getting involved, and what is it you don't know? Well, go try and um, have a play and go find out about it. So these sims are all um, available to them to go and use. The one I'm going to talk about today is this one, and we're very imaginative in engineering. We have our little yellow one, and then we have the big one. Heliflight and Heliflight R. I'm going to talk mainly about the big one today. Um, I just thought I'd give a set of highlights of what we've been doing over 20 years. And I use, as I go through this presentation, when I talk about we, I tend to be using the royal we, because there's lots of people that are involved in this. Um, each of these could be a presentation in themselves. And if I do look at Gareth to volunteer him at some point, I can get you to come back and talk about any of them. Um, but it just shows really the breadth of the things that we've been doing with the simulator, from basic research, new concepts, uh, modes of operation, design work, personal air vehicles, hazard assessments, um, new PhDs looking at degraded problems. There's a whole range of things that if the simulation is good enough, we can use it as a research tool. So the topic about really is how good is good enough, and we'll come back to that later on. We have been fortunate, as Laura Candy mentioned, a couple of the awards. Um, with the support of very good researchers, we get very good outputs from it, and it gets recognized occasionally. Um, and then we then go get off to go uh, do a couple of jollies at the end to try and apply that to a more industry uh, setting as well. Okay, so why do we use flight simulation? That's probably fairly obvious. We can do things in a simulator. We can test things out. We, things that are possibly unsafe, we can, we can uh, do things in a simulator you wouldn't do in the real world necessarily. It can provide a good training tool. It also it stops you flying the aircraft around. And I'm going to talk about aircraft carriers later on. So you can imagine the carbon footprint of steaming an aircraft carrier around for three weeks operating helicopters off it. So we can make a big difference on that. Most importantly for us is that it's a flexible research tool. We can get it to do a whole range of different things and look at a range of different problems. There are other benefits. Um, if we're trying to um, design a product and we want to get it right first time, we can do it in simulation first to risk reduce what's going on. If you're trying to look at the product life cycle and you go through and the costs are involved, so you start with not actually spending anything, by the end of the lifetime, you've spent all your money. Um, you're committing significant amounts of money early on, but you're not actually spending, but you're committing quite a lot. And the most important part about this is that the cost to fix something rises significantly as you go through that life cycle. So if you use modeling simulation in here to get it right first time, you're going to reduce your costs, and more importantly, reduce the time to market as well. So how good is good enough? In order to answer that question, we have to have a definition of fidelity. If we look at simulation, what do you mean by simulation fidelity? One example of this is the physical and functional similarity of the training device to the actual equipment from which it's undertaken. So I've built a simulator. Does it look like the real thing? The problem with that is it centers on the device. And how do you measure how good it is? 
So if the knob's in this position and it's in that position there, does it really make a difference? And it's really focused about the hardware, um, and it's difficult to understand how good it is in terms of transferring what we wanted to do. What we wanted to do in terms of fidelity is allow someone to go in and get training and get the behaviors that you would get in the real world within the simulation environment and transfer that ability out into the real world and get this positive training. So that's the definition that we're going to use as we go through this presentation. So how good is good enough? It all depends. What it is you're doing and what you need it to do. And we're going to see some examples of this. Um, so I'm going to start talking about flight simulation uh, for training particularly. Um, and I'm sure you all know the story of the flight of Icarus. I'm not going to ask people who don't. So Daedalus and Icarus were trying to escape from Crete, made a uh, set of wings out of wax. And the moral of the story, or one of them was, um, when the unfortunate Icarus flew too close to the sun, wax melted, holding uh, the wings, they all fell apart, and the poor guy died. Not a happy story. However, if he'd had a simulator, he'd have understood he'd had inadequate training a lack of acquaintance with the controls and the performance of the machine. Okay, we'll move forward a little bit. Um, Wright Brothers first flew in 1903. In 1910, this article from Flight Magazine identified the need for flight simulation. So in those days, if you had a wine barrel and you could chop it in half and get a few friends around, you could start to make a training device. And it was a sense of giving the, um, the novice uh, an understanding of the controls of the airplane without risking themselves, and that is to be of benefit. So the actual benefits of flight simulation follow on fairly quickly from that first, um, first historic flight. Things have moved on. Um, the Link Trainer, 1929. Um, these things look a little bit dated, but they served the purpose at the time. What was the training requirement, and what was provided to them to allow them to do that? So in terms of instrument flying, this is uh, the world, we think, is the world's first helicopter simulator. So this was attached to the roof of a hangar and used to move around. They just carried out uh, one of the world's first rescues at sea using a helicopter and thought, this is dangerous. Maybe we should have a simulator to do something with it. So we aim, they beat us to it, but we'll come back to the story later on. And technology's moved on, but the underlying principle's still the same. What is it we're training to do, and what do we need to put in the simulation environment to do that? So while the hardware's changed, we've got rid of some of the huge bits of kit we need to run things. Some things did go backwards for a certain period of time. So this is a, a model board and have a camera that would actually respond to what the aircraft was doing. So you have these tiny little uh, model boards, little features, and the camera would fly you through the scenery. Move on a decade, then we get the world's best graphics that you've ever managed in the 1960s. So things do change, but again, underlying principle, what is it we're trying to do? And if you're going to train, you need to know what the training requirement is. So a trainer is going to say, what do you use the vehicle for? Okay, your day-to-day -day purpose is I'm going to use it for this. Oh, right. I need to have a simulator that allows me to do that. Sometimes you have to think, what else do you use the vehicle for? Because you're going to write the specification to allow it to do something that you'd normally do in the real world. You need to capture everything because no matter how much you think you captured it, somebody is going to use that training device for something different. Okay, the other thing, we're talking about fidelity, um, and one thing that was taught a number of years ago was don't confuse complexity with fidelity. Um, I was fortunate enough, uh, probably 15 years ago now, um, to be asked to go and evaluate or get involved with some work that was there looking at needle injection um, and doing radio uh, radiography. And, and this little device here, this pen, is a haptic device. So as you move it, you change the feel of it. So you can move the device using the VR, and it's very modern. Um, you can actually see where the, uh, the needle's going, and you see the change, and you see the needle going in. If you hit a bone, the, the little pen thing really stiffens up, and you can actually feel it doing that. It cost a lot of money to develop in those stages, and a senior clinician came down and said, oh, no, that's very interesting. What's this for? He said, it's all about teaching students to put that initial needle in. They don't want to do it. Cost a lot of money, that. Why don't you just go get yourself an orange? It feels exactly the same. The compliance of putting the needle into the skin and into the orange is similar. So why do you have to go make something that's a lot more complex? Talking of complexity, what we're trying to do in the simulator is have the pilot at the center of this device. 
giving them the cues that they need to operate the simulator in the same way as they would do in the real world. So as we go out, the kind of cues that you pick up are the visual cues. You see things. You hear things. This is the vestibular your balance system. And all these bits and pieces are providing you with cueing. So we need to do the same thing in the simulator. And these features, as we go around the outside, are all the different things, the mechanical things, that you might have to have in the simulator to provide those cues. So we have a device. It's going to cue you. The pilot will hopefully behave in the correct way. And at each of these, there's complicated maths that go along. So there's a lot of complicated math to explain all the magic that goes on in terms of how aircraft fly. There's complicated math that go on in the environment and how you model that. In the dynamics and the motion and how the controls feel. And each of these will own, all have their own fidelity requirements. And you're going to assemble them all together and the pilot is then going to experience that. So the individual feature level uh, fidelity is then going to have to come together. We need a way of uh, assessing that together. You'd be glad to know there's only other one set of equations coming up, and I won't expect you to go through them in the maths homework exercise. Okay, so we've been saying um, previously we've got all these different features. We're trying to stimulate the pilot. The pilot is taking information in, and they're trying to interpret the information, but we're only human. And all the pilot study students know what's about to come. So anyone want to say what that might be a picture of? Shout out, be brave. We always have this argument, it is not a cow. <laughs> OK, if I try to put this little green masking around that, it possibly looks like a Dalmatian with a tree. OK, what you've now done is taken new information and made a new mental model. So if I take that information away again, you can more easily see that information in the background. It hasn't changed, but your mental model has changed. But your brain is very good in trying to make sense of things. So that is a, a prong that you cannot physically make. But your mind is trying to make, in your experience, that looks like a prong. You look in the region here, it is not a 3D object. But your mind will sit there and convince you it is. And the more you look at it, the more it will drive you mad. The context of information is also important. So 2D shape, I can convince you, possibly, that the cube sticks out this way by presenting information like that. Or if I do that, I can convince you might be facing that way. So the context of what you're going to do is quite important. The other thing you do, you operate in a very complex environment, and you're getting lots of information. And sometimes it's difficult to hold that information. You hold typically about seven bits of information in your short-term memory. And I'm going to test your short-term memory now. Okay? We've got two teams playing basketball. Nobody's got a pen. It doesn't matter. You're going to see some teams playing basketball. You're going to pay attention to the team in white. And to make it more difficult, more complex, the white and the black team are going to mix up. And what I want you to do is count the number of passes that the white team makes. I'm then going to give you lots of other information in the presentation. And then hopefully, you might remember that at the end. So how many passes does the team in white make? It's a bit blurry. I had to stretch it out, so it's not the best. The problem becomes, as they start to interact, it's difficult sometimes to actually work out who's passing where. And it gets really busy. At the end of it, I'm going to come to a close, and you're going to remember that number for the next half hour. I'm going to ask you the question at the end. OK, on to the kind of research side of things. Um, one of the big activities that I've been involved with, and lucky to be involved with, is, is on rotorcraft simulation fidelity research. Um, another lesson I learned a long time ago, and advice I was getting, given, is that all models are wrong, but some are useful. So how do we assess the utility of those models? And if we do find out that they're wrong, how do we update them to make them better or more useful? OK, this was a, an activity that I was fortunate enough to be involved with Gareth uh, a long time ago, this group for aviation research and technology in Europe. They have these different working groups. And they did a, a review of all the different standards and the fidelity metrics and the, the gaps, really, uh, of uh, simulation for rotorcraft. Um, and one thing that we'll see later on, in terms of training standards, there's a one-size-fits-all. We have a standard, and it doesn't matter what you're doing with a rotorcraft within that standard, you have that one-size-fits-all mentality. And it's not really appropriate, as we'll see later. There isn't a quantitative test for the fidelity of the overall simulation. So that kind of onion plot that I showed you before with all the different bits and pieces that go together for the pilot, there's no way of assessing that, or there wasn't at that particular time. You're going to put the pilot in, and you're going to ask them, how good is it? And the guidance you get from the uh, certification standard says for the highest level of uh, qualification, 
Fidelity should be very close to the aircraft. What does that mean? There's no guidance on that. So out of this were recommendations that fed into the work that we then took on for the next 10, 15 years or so, looking at objective means for quantifying fidelity uh, and also on motion queuing. And I can see Steve in the audience. Hopefully there's no awkward questions later from Steve on motion queuing. Because Steve will feature a number of times and motion queuing is his thing. What has been important has been the, the partnerships. So we've had a long-standing partnership with the Flight Research Lab at the National Research Council of Canada. And what we get access to is the fly-by-wire helicopter. We can go off and do testing, which I'll mention before. We get to go in it, which is great fun. Um, but also we get to do weird and wonderful things. We, we were trying to understand what was going on with the rotor blade. So I said to him, is there any chance we can stick a GoPro on top of your helicopter? I, went, I think so. And, and yes, they did. Um, and it's the kind of thing that you watch for a period of time and it makes you quite ill. But the willingness of these guys to actually go and do things and the, the interest that they have is, is mutually beneficial. So a lot of this work's been funded by EPSRC and we've got the current Rotorcraft Simulation Fidelity project ongoing at the moment. Uh, complicated slide. Um, really, it's all about, as I mentioned before, defining what the requirements are, finding ways of assessing them, looking at what we call per uh, perceptual and predictive fidelity. I'll come back to that in a moment. Seeing what the differences are and is it fit for purpose. If it's not, we have to upgrade and do something about it. So if we look at these two elements um, in the next few slides, first one we'll look at is predictive fidelity. Um, so I mentioned the simulator standards. And in the tables, they have a, a bunch of performance requirements. So if you do the flight test in the real world and you get your simulation data, there are tolerances that you must have to meet to satisfy the level and qualify the simulator. So you can see in here that um, we have a particular case where we have a plus or minus value. So we can be plus 1.5 degrees, or we could be minus 1.5 degrees. And this goes all the way through uh, a bunch of different tests. What we don't know, or don't know at the time, is whether or not those tolerances are satisfactory. Where do they come from? Is it fit for purpose for all the different ranges of applications that we're about to see? So what do we do? We go out and flight test. This is an example of some tests we did just before COVID, uh, we asked the pilot to go do some maneuvers, and we gather the data. The data that you see at the top here is not for that particular test, because when it's going 95 knots, we're not really standing anywhere near the aircraft, but we can stand in the field. And what we have in the plot is the pilot control input goes in, and then these colorful lines show the response of the model. So the one that we're interested in is the blue line, which is the flight test data, and that's where we started with the model. And with very clever people like Dr. Ling Hai Lu, who sat in the audience, we can do comparisons between the model and the simulation. We can use a range of different techniques to identify the differences and then go and fix those differences. So a lot of the research has been focused on model updating or model renovation. Another stage bit of advice I was given, no one believes that, in this case, it was CFD simulation, except the person who created it. Everyone believes the flight test data except the person who measured it. So you can start trying to match from simulation and flight test, and if you're matching with something that's not well-defined, well-captured, well-logged, and you really know the quality of the data, the fidelity of it, you might be chasing your tail. And we're gonna see a complicated way of looking at how to fix this later on. Okay, one size fits all. The, there's three different sets of maneuvers we did in Canada, all different levels of agility, different levels of aggression. So this is called an Axel D-cell, pilot flies off. This is turning around the tail. This is a very low speed maneuver, hovering. Those performance requirements we saw before should fit any of these different maneuvers. There are specific ones in there for climbs and descents, but we've got these tolerances, and are they good enough? And just to give an example, and this will come back slightly later as well, this is a set of results that came out of one of the garter activities that you saw before. What we have is an aircraft in this position here, this helicopter, it's gonna have an engine failure, and it's going to land. If we use the tolerances in the standards, this is the scatter that you get. So if you go to the upper bound and you go to the lower bound, some of which will be safe and some won't be. So are the tolerances good enough? Is, does that one size fit all actually work? And the answer is no. In terms of model updating, um, we were involved with a, a NATO activity. Uh, and the idea of this was to look at a range of different assessment methods, metrics, and how do you update the models? And there's a range of different applications that you're going to apply them to. So we can see all the different aircraft that you can apply them to. Some are fairly standard, some are a little bit novel, and it goes all the way down to the UAV level. So across the range of different applications. 
Um, there were different methods, from quite simple ones to quite complex. And the idea was to identify how effective those methods were in terms of the update, the kind of cost involved, the timing involved, and the benefit that you get from the end of it. And the output from this was to try and develop a report and lecture material for the next generation of engineers to say, if I've got a problem and I've got an issue, how do I go about fixing it? Well, for this particular application, I've got some guidance to go and do that. One of the big things about this was sharing data and the collaboration that we had. So uh, there are all the different partners that are involved in the, um, in the research. And you can see it was truly multinational. Um, important part that we did have with this, it was a mix between industry, research, and academia. And that partnership was very important. That's one thing that's been a, another lesson learned through the 20-odd years of doing it. You don't do these things in isolation. You, you're working with other like-minded people to try and answer the questions of how good is good enough. Okay, we're going to come on to perceptual fidelity, and the next slide I'm going to show is not mine. It's deliberate, and it's the pilot's impression of himself. So that plot that we saw before, we have that little pilot sat in the middle. This is what the chief test pilot in Canada thinks he looks like um, when he's busy doing his flight testing. And when he's doing his fidelity assessment, he's got three pillars of fidelity to give a fidelity rating. He's got the human element, him doing things, he's got the environment he's operating, and the machine. And he has to understand all of those together to make the fidelity assessment. And in terms of how you do that, the pilot must be proficient in the task and the vehicle. And you can do fidelity assessment, and it is allowed for training simulators where you don't necessarily have to be proficient or recent um, on task or vehicle. Vehicles should be sim similarly configured, so you're comparing like with like. Um, and the test conditions must be comparable. And the most important part about this is the methodology for measuring that fidelity. It has to be rigorous, robust, and repeatable. And there's two elements to that, is the subjective part and the objective part. We're going to have a look at the subjective part first. <laughs> when I started with Gareth a long time ago, I came from um, the, the impact research group. We did a lot of measurements, and I asked about calibrating a pilot. And I said to Gareth, how do you calibrate the pilot as a sensor? This is one of our sensors. He's an uh, ex-Navy test pilot who now flies for BA. Um, and trying to calibrate Andy over the years has proved rather difficult. And we said to him, apply your vast amount of knowledge and understanding to come up with the fidelity rating scale. So he went off to the pub. And as you can tell from this napkin, this was his creativity, where it's a rating scale of 1 to 10. But 1 is brilliant, and 10 is not particularly brilliant. And that was the best that we started with. We thought we need something a little bit better than that. So over uh, collaboration again with the guys in the NRC, we came up with a simulation fidelity rating scale. And the key elements about this are the task performance and the compensation. So what do you achieve in the real world in terms of performance? How, what level of accuracy? And how do you actually compensate for doing that task? Lesson Gareth taught me, if you think about driving a car, you turn left, you turn the wheel. That should be the only maneuver that you have to do. If you start having to do other bits and pieces, those extra bits and pieces are the compensation element. So you want to look at the compensation in the real world and the compensation in the sim. The difference is adaptation. So what we have here in the terms of the uh, fidelity rating scales, we're going to compare the task performance. We're going to look at the change in your behavior flight versus sim. And then we're going to make an assessment of the utility of the sim for transfer training. And you wind up in this matrix here, where if you can't really tell the difference and you get the same level of performance, we say it's full transfer training. The simulator is good enough that you can go straight from the sim into the real thing. Now, when we did this, it was all for rotorcraft, but this is training in any kind of virtual environment. It doesn't have to be helicopter, it doesn't have to be aviation. You're doing something virtually, how does that transfer into the, uh, into the modern real world? Um, as we start to change our behaviors, and we're not getting the same performance, we drop down in terms of the transfer of training. And eventually, you get to a point where you shouldn't be using the simulator at all. In terms of what the scale looks like, so here's an example where we've done uh, a task, and the pilots reported they had similar performance and moderate adaptation. So this is what comes out of it. How they use the rating scale, the important thing here is you define what the task is. It could be a flying task, a non-flying task, it could be aviation, it could be anything, it doesn't really matter. Somebody used this in a tank driving simulator. They have a simulator, they have a tank, they don't want to use the tank a lot, they want to use the simulator. So they did exactly this, but they defined the task. And then the pilots make an assessment in terms of the performance that they got in the real world and the performance they got in the simulator. And by answering the questions, he's come into a position here where he's, he's answered to a point where it's going to come out that he had similar performance and moderate adaptation. And he gets a fidelity rating. So we're saying there are, there are issues, 
we can do something about those. We have a questionnaire that goes along with that to identify what the deficiencies are so we can go ahead and fix them. Uh, here's an example of trying to deal with a comparison between flight and simulation. So we've done this hover maneuver in the, uh, in the aircraft and we've done it in the simulator. What the pilot's trying to do is maneuver over to cone. There's a little ball here and he's trying to keep the ball in the box. You can see that ball there. He's trying to balance that in there. What we see in the top right are the control activities. So um, in the red color is the flight test where the controls are moving. So he's moving the controls uh, forwards and backwards, left and right. He's using the pedals and he's also using a height control as well. And we can record those as height traces, that's why it's time traces, and we can try and look at ways of, if we've got two bunch of squiggly lines, how different are they, and how do we quantify those kind of things? And what we have is what we lovingly called initially the Wodgeogram, after Dr. Wodge Mimon, who invented this. And what we're trying to do is look at the time history we've got here. You can see there's all different elements and components within that, and how do we can deconstruct that into something that gives us more information about where the pilot was working hard? And this area here is looking at the frequency and the amplitude of those motions. So those hot spots show you where the pilot's really working hard. And we can do a comparison between the flight sim and the, uh, and the test aircraft with the data that we've got to go along with the fidelity rating that we get from that particular test. So there's work on going on that and how do you actually come up with these different levels and quantify those. In terms of use of the scale, um, defining training envelopes for whatever application that might be. Um, using it for research where you don't have the data. We can see use of this for design and certification in the moment. And then we've tried to produce some guidance. We had a workshop running this summer. Uh, we had a bunch of pilots uh, and engineers come across to try and put some context, the guidance material together so that we can actually publish this as a document. It's already been supported as part of a um, MOD document where they're looking at digital models and simulations supporting our awareness decision making, how good are models, and what methods might you use to do that. So the rating scale's been noted in that to actually go and use that as a methodology. Okay, very quick run through Steve's career doing flight simulation and motion. Um, do we need motion platforms? So this is our big simulator that we've got here. The pilot's going to be flying around and we're going to feed the base with model outputs and the base is going to move. Do we need it? First thing we need to do is understand how do you pick up some of this information. And I'm going to not focus on the visual element. I'm going to focus on the vestibular motion. So in your inner ear, you have these semicircular canals. And these are fluid-filled tubes that you've got that give you rotation information, similar to what you have in an aircraft. But what it's giving you is head-related, not necessarily uh, aircraft-related. In the real world, you'd put a control input in, the aircraft would accelerate and would move off and fly around and do things. We're constrained with the motion platform. We only have a small volume, so we can give some kind of acceleration to start off with, but then we need to bring it back again because we've run out of leg extension and we need to bring it back so the pilot doesn't notice and it's ready for the next acceleration maneuver. And we have a control system that allows us to do that and we can change some of the parameters within that and tune that. So there was a lot of work that went on uh, to actually look at motion platform tuning to answer the question, do we need motion? How you provide that motion is a completely different question. So what we have on the top left are people playing around with an industrial robot in not a particularly safe way. Um, what you have on the top right, though, is um, a robot that's at the Max Planck Institute for Cybernetics. So they have had the sensible idea to lift it off the floor and give you a bit of space. Um, originally, when we went to visit that, they had it set up as a uh, Formula One racing simulator. So the actual car setup was up there. And again, you're just trying to provide these kind of cues in a more sensible way. Um, they have other wonderful toys at Max Planck. This is what we used to call the flying carpet. So you have the, uh, the platform here is connected by cables to uh, essentially the walls of the sports hall, and you fly around like it's a magic carpet. Um, this one is in, in Holland. It's called Desdemona. Just to give you a sense of scale, that's the door to get in. And this sits there in a bunch of gimbals, and it can fully rotate, and it can also move along this arm. So each of these need to be controlled, and how do you design those controls? In terms of quantifying it, there are uh, criteria that are out there, um, talking about motion cues. So if you go from the real world, you get in one-to-one -one motion, as you would expect. So you get this region of high fidelity. So the motions you get are not noticeably different from those that you get in visual flight. You're seeing and feeling the same kind of things. And there's some simulators, this is the NASA VMS out the States, where they have got high fidelity because of the motion. Dropping into medium, you start to get differences, and then low. So this was our starting point. If, if we're looking purely on terms of capability and the size of the simulator, can we move 
some of these points from the low fidelity, medium fidelity, into the high fidelity. So what we can change is the gain, how quickly you're going to do things, and then the differences that you're actually going to get. So Steve came up with a, we like rating scales, um, came up with another rating scale looking at motion fidelity, talking about the utility of the cues to do the particular task and how um, response of the vehicles. You have a number of descriptors here that start to identify the deficiencies, and that's the kind of thing that you might want to go and fix. So if you think about the previous slide, that's high, medium, and low fidelity. So Steve did a set of testing, and we've done other testing since, where we're looking to do a maneuver. This is an aircraft flying from one position to the other, and we can change those numbers that I mentioned before, and we can move the simulator from a region of low fidelity, and you get a correct tuning, you get quite high fidelity and high fidelity. And what you see in the motion platform is a completely different response. So what the pilot is receiving is going to be different. Same task, but they're going to be receiving different cues as they go and do that. So there's a good way of starting to look at the motion fidelity requirements for, for particular movers. Um, this is ongoing. We've got other work looking at motion fidelity for certification uh, and ship operations, which we'll see next. Okay, so talking about operations. Um, anytime you take an aircraft to a ship, you have to do uh, sea trials, which are quite expensive. And this is a little Norwegian uh, offshore patrol vessel that sat there, and the helicopter pilot has to come in and land on the back of that deck at some point. What you can't see is the air wake that's coming off the back of the ship. So this is buffer being buffeted around by the air wake. And you're looking for the combination of wind directions and wind strengths that are safe to land in. And the only way that people typically do this is by going out to sea. So these can be expensive, and they can be potentially dangerous. You can see that ship's moving around a lot. Um, he's not trying to track the ship at this point. He's just being disturbed by the air wake that's in there. So it's quite high workload, and he's trying to find those limits. So what we call the invisible enemy, the ship's air wake, is what he's contending with at the moment. So the question that we started to ask is, can we use flight simulation to inform the determination of those limits? And what are the fidelity requirements for that? I mentioned it's quite a dangerous thing. So this is the same pilot who was flying the previous aircraft, flying this one. And it was a, an evaluation of um, the aircraft and its capabilities. Same kind of thing, flying around aircraft, move from deck moving. And then you don't really want that to happen. So do it in the simulator. So we had a, a, a program of work looking at the different requirements. And very similar to that plot that I showed before, what are the different components? We have the air wake. You have the flight model, you have the simulator motion, how important that is, and this is our pilot, one of our pilots flying to the back of one of the ships we use. Um, the visuals in terms of how good they are, and then ship motion, and I'll come back to ship motion in a couple of slides time. But again, each of these things will have their own fidelity requirements, and you're gonna put them all together, and you're trying to understand what happens when you put them together, and the pilot makes those assessments. So we can assess them individually, but we also need to assess them as a component together. So in terms of how we put this together, um, we take the air weights from these very expensive computations, and we can make these more and more expensive by adding more information. So we're running the risk of adding complexity and not necessarily improving the fidelity. We are going to apply, so this actually gives you velocities. So we can get lots of different velocities, different points in space, and we're going to attach them to the flight model. We then go into the simulator, and we've already looked at that uh, before, and what we're trying to define is what they call the shoal, the ship helicopter operating limit. And this is a combination of wind, direction, and speed. So if we come around, so zero is straight ahead, and you've got different directions, so 10 degrees, 20, 30, all the way around. And these lines as you go out this are the speed, so 10 knots, 20 knots, 30 knots. That black line through testing at sea defines where the safety limit is. So if you happen to be in a green 80 wind at 40 knots, you're outside the limit, and you can't go and land. So we want to try and define that. And you have to go out to sea to do that, and you could be chasing the conditions, and you might not get the requirements you got. In terms of the computations, this is an old one that, that we still show, but we're trying to understand the aircraft operating and all this uh, disturbed airflow at the end of it. Once this starts to happen, you can start to see where those features develop. Where do they come from? What is it on the ship that's causing that level of turbulence? And thinking about a design element, what could we do about that to try and make that less worse for operating in? I mentioned we like rating scales. There's another one. It's all about how hard a pilot is working. So they do a task, and they're trying to understand what spare capacity they have. So I'm flying along. Can I do additional things? If it's nice and easy, you're up here. You've got plenty of spare capacity. You can do lots of different things. 
as you start to increase the workload and they're trying to maneuver the aircraft around and they're disturbed, spare capacity drops off. So we use that as one of the measures for assessing how strong the airwakes are. In terms of the fidelity of it, you can do quite a simple calculation. And these are some of the ratings. So that scale that I showed you before, we have different wind directions, different workload ratings for different speeds. So in that particular case, the pilot didn't find it particularly difficult. Plenty of spare capacity for additional tasks. As we then started including the unsteady airwakes, so the video that you saw before, the pilot workload goes up and it's more realistic of the real world. So we need to ensure that the pilots are cued to the disturbances so that when we start to define limits, we've got some confidence in those limits. Um, this work is ongoing through another NATO activity. And again, the importance of collaboration is, 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 needs to be reinforced. We have colleagues that are doing the computations, we have colleagues doing the experimental work um, in terms of wind tunnel and validation, uh, and we're also doing some stuff at Liverpool. So a couple of weeks ago, um, the question that we were trying to address was, if you start to do these calculations and include the effect of the ship moving, because it normally isn't, what happens to the turbulence behind and does it really matter? So as part of the working group, they came up with a new test vehicle. So this is the NATO generic destroyer which have become a new benchmark. So people doing experimental work can do wind tunnel testing, they can do CFD, and we can come to the flight simulation and share this data, and it becomes a, a new uh, way of doing comparisons. And it's looking at all the different metrics that people use and what's the best way forward for doing these assessments. So these are tests from a couple of weeks ago, and what we're going to hear are two of the Canadian test pilots. Uh, Danny has got a set of eye tracking glasses on, so this little red circle is going to move around to show you what he's looking at. And they're doing an assessment of uh, one of the particular wind conditions. Am I allowed to give up at some point? Sure. There's no quitting. There's no quitting. OK. There we go. Here's the bubble. So the interesting thing is he's coming like along. Is coming we start to get a sense from the visual cues of where is he looking. Yeah, and the, the plan that we're going to have is try to use his glasses in the real world um, to to, for comparison purposes. So they typically come alongside, and he's now checking where he is relative to the ship. He needs to be along that line. Once he's alongside that, he can then do the transition across and he's going to sit there and be immersed in this wake that we've got. There we go. And moving across. Now it's really good. Okay. Oh, drifting back. And going up now, correcting. Corrective. Bit of lag. And off he goes. So the, the question is, Bit of does it matter? Well, you have to stay tuned from that. Poor Nick. It's still going through the data from two weeks ago, so it's something that we'll come back and report on it at some point. But it's again answering the question, do we need to do these things? Do we need to add that complexity to the simulation? Um, we've used it in support of um, real-world trials, so with, with BA Systems, when they were working through the project, trying to put two very expensive assets together, coming up with a simulation environment that allows you to do that. So all the different components that we talked about before, doing this similar kind of thing, and what Liverpool was involved with was providing the airwake to go and do that. And the idea was to provide a simulation environment so the crew, both the ship and the pilots, could work together to look at all the different test runs they want to do, practice them, and understand the process of what they were going to do when they went out to sea to really be very effective with it. Um, in terms of validation, we have a, a water tunnel at Liverpool, 90,000 litre recirculating water tunnel. And this is a model of the aircraft carrier in the water tunnel. We have a little probe here that can actually sense the flow of um, particles as it's going past, and we can do measurements of the turbulence of that flow. We can do the calculations, and then we can do comparisons. And the reason you can't see very much on here is that Neil did such a good job of the calculations, we think, that you can't really tell the difference between flight and simulation and the experimental work, so the CFD as well. How good is good enough? That looks good enough, but we don't have a quantification method for doing that at the moment. Okay, that thing I put into um, BE Sim, um, and this is the feedback that they receive afterwards, uh, which is one of our favorite ones that we roll out. That the trial preparation was extensive and the simulator unequivocally formed the backbone of our efforts, giving us the utmost confidence from day one. As I hovered alongside for the first time, I felt overwhelming deja vu. Testament to the team creating a world-class simulator. So well done, Steve. And on the back of that, we were fortunate enough to be uh, awarded a uh, Innovating for Success uh, BAE Systems Award. Although I still think Steve looked like a Bond villain on that one. 
Okay, now we've got a simulation environment, what else can we do with it? So we say, well, that was all configured for F-35 going to QEC. We're interested in helicopters. We're going to do some testing. And a typical test is that we come along, aircraft bobbles around in the airway and comes down to land. And we can look in the CFD and start to interrogate these really high levels of turbulence and put the pilot in that point and try and understand if you're landing in different parts of the aircraft carrier, where you're going to wind up having the difficulties. So those workload ratings that we saw before for this particular spot, you can actually see that they go significantly high. So we can actually start to define limits in simulation. So they've done this with F-35. We're suggesting that MOD does a similar approach when they start doing more of the rotorcraft testing. The other good thing is we get to go on board. So we went up to Scotland uh, and got to go on the aircraft carrier. In fact, we've been on both of them because the Prince of Wales came in. And again, thanks to BAE and others, we managed to get on board the ship. But Neil was on, uh, on duty and Denise managed to blag herself in as well. So there are nice field trips that we do get to go on. As I mentioned, we've got a simulation capability. Um, we don't just stop with it. So we were then asked the question, what happens if the aircraft lifts? So the aircraft live in the hangar in here. You've got to bring them up on top of the ship. If you've got the aircraft on the, um, on the lift and you've got the hangar doors open, does that make a difference to the airflow? And they were going out to sea and had a real concern that they, they might have issues, but they couldn't do anything um, in the short time uh, period. So what they asked us to do in the water tunnel again was do a similar kind of set of tests. So we modified that model that you saw before. We created these lifts and we stuck the model into the, um, into the water tunnel, did the measurements, and then we've done the CFD of it as well. So it's a much quicker, cleaner, greener way of doing the assessments. So you can go back and give guidance that operationally, we don't think you're going to have a problem. Also use it a lot for design. Um, I saw the videos before, the pilot flying the, behind the ship. You can actually start to look using simulation. What happens if you change the design of the ship at the back? Can we make it to so a point, you're still going to get an air wake off it, but can we reduce the impact with those design changes? We also put anemometers on the ship to measure the wind. And unfortunately, the standards need a lot, lot of looking at because they typically aren't in a clean airflow. Um, a lot of work looking at exhausts. So what's the impact of you operating the helicopter in and around those hot gases? Is it a big problem? And the reason this came about is that, again, thinking about trying to get this design right first time, they were committing to the design of what's now the uh, Type 26 ship. 10 billion pound program. You want to try and do the best you can to get the best results and not have problems later on. On the back of the Type 26 program, they've sold the ship to the Australians, and they've been asking the same questions. The Canadians have now got the same or very similar ship, and we've been asked to do similar work of trying to identify, through simulation, the impact of design changes. Last little bit, looking on certification. Um, this project's all about trying to develop guidance to say how good does a simulation need to be so you can replace or, or complement the real-world flight testing. So again, it's another fidelity issue, and, and we're working with the regulator authorities to go have a look at that. Um, same rationale for using a simulation. You use it when the flight demonstration might be too risky or the conditions are too difficult. And the benefit the simulation offers is that you've got repeatability and you can change the conditions to match what you actually want to go and test. You can look at safe, uh, failure cases and safety, and you can change um, the parameters within the environment very quickly and go do those assessments. Here's the complicated slide to explain how we're going to go and do it. The important part about this slide is that you start with the requirements. What is it you're trying to do? And getting those well-defined. So that then when you look at the flight model side of things, or the flight test measurement system, or in this case, the flight simulator, we've got a set of requirements against which we're trying to make the judgments. Is it uh, satisfactory? There are different methods of uh, fidelity assessment that we've already talked about. And if there are deficiencies, we can tune and go back around that loop. So that works ongoing at the moment. And what we're going to have next week is one of the ARSA test pilots. And one of the maneuvers is going okay, to be flying is what they call a, a rejected takeoff. So here's what you see in the flight manual. So the helicopter is going to take off, and he's starting to climb out to a takeoff decision point. And at some point along that path, an engine's going to fail. So you can imagine doing this in the real world has got a substantial amount of risk associated with it. Here's one of our evaluation pilots that's flying the maneuver. And he's about to have a bad day. Engine fail. And he then has to recover the aircraft back onto the helipad. And what we're interested here in terms of the simulation side of things, the effect of motion and the visuals. How do we sufficiently cue the pilot in the simulator so we can actually get the same performance you would in simulation as you would in the real world? To give confidence 
that you can go back to the regulation bodies and say this simulator is good enough to do that certification task. Right, just to start wrapping things up, um, I have, I've had to explain this video to a number of people. Everybody know, obviously all big fans of 1927 sci-fi movies, Metropolis, no? Some of you might recognize that video more from Queen, Radio Gaga. That's the video they use for that. Um, it's a dystopian look at the future about how people are going to operate. Um, the reason we show this, you've got people traveling to work in different modes of transport. Uh, an example here of quite a number of years later of a project that was run at Liverpool on personal air vehicles. So if you're in your lovely home in Cheshire and you want to fly into the center of Liverpool, you want to have a personal air vehicle that'll take you there. And there's different guidance technologies, how does it handle? These are all the kind of things you can look in a simulator and answer the question of. The reason it's relevant, I'm not sure if the vertical lot made it today. Ah, Ben's there. Here's a uh, concept from vertical airspace, which I think you had a good day yesterday testing. Um, what you can do in simulation is start to look at this piloted versus no piloted option. You can start to look at the interface. You can start to look at the training requirements for this before you've actually got the vehicle fully certified. So again, it can inform the certification process. In terms of future uses, VR is going to feature a lot more. So this is a Swiss company that used our fidelity rating scale to make an assessment of this VR simulator on a motion platform. We're going to be operating in much more complex information environments. So how do we put this together so we don't overload the pilots? And how do we know we're overloading them? So we have a project at the moment looking at human training and operations in what we call data-rich environments. Do you notice information? Do you get it presented in the correct kind of way? So one of the things we need to do is understand how the pilots pick up their information. So here's a task. We've got a pilot going to fly along here. And what he's doing is wearing a set of eye-tracking goggles, as you saw before. So there's Charlie's eyeballs, which is a bit bizarre to have looking at you. But that's where he's actually looking in the scene. So as he's doing a task, we can see where the pilot's looking. As we change the complexity of the task and the information we might give him, we want to see how that impacts his scan patterns and his behaviors. But it's still very bizarre looking at somebody's eyeballs. Um, started a new project. We always wanted to do this, take what we did uh, from ships into different environments, um, emergency medical services, or in this case, looking at offshore operations. So uh, quite a big calculation was done to calculate. So these are all the different turbulent bits and pieces that are coming off a, an oral rig. Right. And then there's our pilot coming in to try and land on that. Uh, and again, the motion is quite important as, as he goes through this. The standards at the moment are based on information that was produced in the 1990s, where the state of the art of this modeling needed improvement. So we've now got the capability of informing those new standards and getting new criteria. Because the regulations we've got here are much more restrictive to what you saw going to the back of a ship. So it reduces the flexibility. If you're flying four hours out to a rig in northern Canada, you want to make sure you'll be able to land on it without having to come all the way back again. Um, there's a piece of work that's just starting on the, our 70-20-10 concept that we came up with over one lunch break. Of We can do a lot in simulation, and we can do a lot with a digital test pilot. So how do we capture the pilot's behavior and come up with something that we can do a lot in the sim, um, with a digital test pilot? We then identify what we want to go test in the flight sim based on what we get out of the model, and then eventually you'll only do 10% out at sea. So MOD think this is a wonderful idea. Um, they funded a PhD student, and hopefully in the next four years we'll be able to answer the question, is it 70, 20, 10 or something different? The other key part of this is there's been lots of conversations going on with all these different partners to try and answer this question. And we've now got a mechanism with a new funding stream that's coming online that they're all coming together to share information, to share models, to share data and experiences, so we can actually better inform this process. Students, you, you are the next generation. I was going to put a Star Trek thing on, but I thought I won't. Um, our students have got access to those facilities that you saw before, and they've been pre-COVID very engaged with things. So this was a charity event that they did, where we gave them a problem saying, right, you've got the simulators, go do something useful with it. Don't sit in the pub all day talking about what you're going to do, go and do something. So they did themselves, they learned by playing, they learned to set up a around the UK flight. They all had to plan the, the flight. Most of them weren't pilots. They had real-time weather, and they had real-time air traffic control. So they learned all these new skills by playing. So it is a bit of a game, but it's a game to an end. The flight simulation group is, is kicking off again. And we're hoping that the first years, I did see some first years before, will have the opportunity to get involved in these things and come up with their own ideas. In year three, you're going to do a research project. The simulators are uh, available for you to do that. What is it you want to do? 
Okay, memory test. How many passes? 11. 10? Higher than 11? Okay, you can go check. How many passes does the team in white make? Every time I show this, I forget to count. Did you get the number you thought of? Hands up if you did not see the dancing bear. You all saw the dancing bear? What dancing bear? Watch it again. I think some of you are admitting not to seeing the dancing bear. So the way I framed this problem was you're in the complex environment, I'm getting you to pay attention to one part of it. And that one part is what the people in white are doing, told you to ignore everything else, including the dancing bear. I did this with a bunch of students and I had to show the video four times and actually got the students to come out. But the point of this in terms of everything that we've been looking at up to this point is we live and work and operate in a complex environment. And we can use simulation to try and understand that because sometimes we're going to miss things. As we're adding more complexity to it, we need to understand what's the impact it's going to have on safety and the pilot themselves. In terms of future challenges, there are novel configurations coming out. There's still the need to improve safety. Helicopter safety records aren't significantly improving. And what the industry wants to do is have tools that allow them to get products out to market as quickly as possible, reducing costs. Simulation is going to be key to doing this. It's going to be a very important thing. So for the young people in the audience, there's plenty of opportunities. We know for a fact industry are shouting out for simulation people um, because we're doing the same shout. It's a very niche set of people that we can get to do these things. The collaboration that we've had between academia and industry has been really important as part of the skills development for employees, but also the interaction. And it's got to the point now where training or so people with funding are, are recommending and insisting that academia is involved in the research projects that they put out there. So there's a call at the moment, and we know academia has to be involved with it because the funding partners said so. As we have these tools, we must have reality checks to answer that question is how good is good enough? What level of confidence do we have in those tools that we can make those decisions to take the real benefit from simulation? This is my uber geeky moment. VR is going to be brilliant. It's going to give all kinds of new opportunities, not just virtual reality, mixed reality, augmented reality. Our colleagues that are from Canada I showed you before, this is what they're doing. And they're using our fidelity rating scale. So they're doing VR. What they've actually got, so this is the VR headset. So the Saturn VR, and they're going to do a deck landing. So they don't want to do what we've done with the motion simulator. They're actually flying it around in, the, uh, in VR. What they're really doing is they're actually flying the VR in the real helicopter. So those question of motion cues go away. You're flying it around in the helicopter. Using a gaming engine to do the visualization, but it becomes a lot cheaper way of doing things. And what they're going to do is go into the simulator on the ground and do the comparisons. Do we actually need to be in the aircraft? It's still uh, expensive to operate the aircraft, but can we do it ground-based? And is there a significant difference? If there's not, then we can then do things a lot cheaper um, and reduce the cost or just prioritize what we're doing. And I think the final message is it's going to be fun. So next generation, you've got all these new toys to go and play with, and the costs are coming down. Um, so I'm going to close with some thanks. I don't hope to orchestrate this properly so Gareth and Ian were sat next to each other, but you're not too far. So thank you to the Welsh Wizards, as I started calling you on, not to your faces, um, for taking that gamble 22 years ago, uh, taking a poor Mecky and making him an aero person. I'd also like to thank Ian for his motivational speech as I walked into the interview, where he said, you're the only candidate, don't stuff it up. <laughs> the work kids. Becky Matea started calling me the work, that's why I started calling them the work kids. They're the ones that do all the hard work, well, occasionally they're doing the hard work. Um, and the common theme that started at the beginning, there does seem to be a lot of going to the pub and doing other bits and pieces. But it's because of their hard work that you see the results that have come out here today. The engineering staff, we've been supported a lot through the technical staff and all the other infrastructure around engineering. Dr. Edwards, would you like to find yourself on that picture? Some of them still some, that's Prof. Jones, Dr. Edwards, I saw Steve sneak in before, killer colour, Yane Hyde lurking at the back, 
very young John Motter's head. And I don't know who that lady is, but I don't want to embarrass her by saying she sat there. The test pilots have been integral to doing all this. Their skills are the one that gets us a decent result. I can fly, I'm just a sim pilot and a bit of a geek. They're the ones that provide the results and the real world experience and help us to, to navigate through the testing that we're going to do. We had a bunch, I can't fit them all on here, but all the interest, industry partners and academic partners that have been involved trying to answer that question of how good is good enough. It's been really good fun and hopefully will continue to be unless I win the lottery. And then finally, the family for putting up with a geek, me traveling. Um, I have to come back here. I have to answer IT questions in remote places at remote times. But it has been fun, and thanks for listening as I've gone through things. So is it just a game, or is it more than just a game? I hope you've had the message today that there's a lot of complexity in it, and it is more than just a game, but there's a lot of benefit that you get from it as well. So thank you for your attention. So thank you, Mark, uh, for a fantastic uh, lecture today. Um, my name is Ian Patterson. I'm Dean of the School of Engineering. I'm a relative newcomer uh, to the School of Engineering. I've only been here a decade. Um, I, I hope that Mark's uh, videos of, of ship motion and so on didn't uh, make you uh, feel seasick um, or ill. Uh, for me, uh, they evoke memories of, of uh, my uh, training as a um, naval warfare officer nearly 40 years ago during which I was uh, privileged to fly helicopters and, and fixed-wing aircraft and, and to serve on an aircraft carrier. Um, now, Mark has, has given us a, a remarkable overview of what's possible in flight simulation and, and some insight uh, as to what might be possible in the future. Um, maybe sometime this century, it'll be uh, possible that we can simulate absolutely everything in the world and experience it uh, through VR or, or virtual reality. And, and that's the, the central sort of uh, assumption of a book that I've been reading recently called Reality Plus, Virtual Worlds and the Problems of Philosophy by uh, a, a New York philosopher, David Chalmers, at, at uh, New York University. And um, uh, there's two parts to, to his main thesis. Uh, one is that life in a virtual world uh, can be as good in principle as life outside the virtual world, uh, and that you could lead a full and meaningful life uh, in a virtual world. I don't know how long it'll take Mark to create that sort of virtual world, although I think actually he spends quite a lot of time in his simulators. Um, and the other part of his, his thesis is, is that uh, the world we're living in could be a virtual world. You know, if, if we could create a complete virtual world in, a, in this century, then maybe someone's already done it, and, and that's what we're living in. Uh, so, I hope you'll all join me uh, for a drink downstairs in, in the uh, atrium uh, in a moment. Uh, but your homework or your discussion point, you know, whilst you're having your drink, and uh, perhaps as the more you have, the easier it'll be to have the discussion, is, you know, are we in a simulation or are we not? Um, so, so, on that uh, point, I'd, I'd like to, to ask you to join me in uh, thanking Mark for a fantastic um, uh, presentation. Uh, before you put your hands together, uh, Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Can I just advertise that we've got two more uh, inaugural uh, lectures coming up, one at the beginning of each of the next uh, two terms. So mark these dates in your diary and, and come along for what I hope will be equally uh, interesting and entertaining uh, lectures. But for now, it's Mark's day, uh, so please join me in, in, in another round of applause for excellent uh, lecture. <laughs> I think that's Ian's hint for you to go for a drink. Um, but if I could ask a favour, that's a, that's a new, very quick one. If I can ask just family and friends and whoever wants to, we're just going to try and take a photo to capture that for the day. And then I know I'm delaying you from your drinks, but you can put up with it. So the rest of you, I hope to see you downstairs. I also need a volunteer to take a photo. <laughs>